Ça, c'est jouet imunio, ça, c'est blague. Oh, gono, roi des anges, les hommes et petit à moi, soit à moi. This program, Haiti Stories, is presented by the University of California Humanities Research Institute in partnership with the UCLA Fowler Museum and the UC Irvine Program in Literary Journalism. I'd like to thank my colleague and friend, uh, Director David Theo Goldberg of the UC HRI, which is the easy way to say University of California Humanities Research Institute, and also Amy Willentz, Professor of English at UC Irvine for organizing this program and for inviting the Fowler to be the venue for such an important afternoon. Despite the tragedies that have struck the Haitian nation, Haiti's story, as I think we all know, is also filled with a remarkably rich and complex artistic and cultural legacy. The Fowler is a fitting venue for today's panel discussion because we have made a long-standing and deep commitment to presenting the dynamic and ever-changing visual culture of Haiti. The major exhibition, Sacred Arts of Haitian Vaudoux, which was organized by the Fowler Museum and opened here in 1995 and went on to six other museums nationwide, was a groundbreaking look at the arts that define and activate sacred Vodou practice. Its lead curator was Donald Cosentino, a professor in the Department of World Arts and Cultures and a distinguished scholar of Haitian Vodou arts who is on the program this afternoon and also who has a profound understanding of these expressive liturgical genres. He also has strong ties to Haiti's artists, both artists in Haiti and in Haiti's diasporas. In the course of identifying the hundreds of objects to be included in sacred arts of Haitian Vodou, the Fowler added considerably to its permanent collection and now possesses what inarguably is one of the finest, if not the finest, and most comprehensive collections of Haitian Vodou arts in the United States. So it is in light of this richness that we have organized a small exhibition on view upstairs in our galleries in our Fowler and Focus space called Art and the Unbreakable Spirit of Haiti. And we hope that you'll have time to look at this show, either you have already or you can after the program. This show was curated by Patrick Polk, who's the Fowler Museum's curator of Latin American and Caribbean popular arts, and himself a Haitian scholar who received his PhD here at UCLA, working with Donald Cosentino and writing a thesis on Haitian Vodou banners or drapeau. He's organized a number of shows for us featuring these wonderful sequined banners. And I think it's fair to say that both UCLA and the Fowler Museum, if not the planet, uh, are very lucky to have both Donald Cosentino and Patrick Polk as a part of our immediate Haitian arts and cultures universe. So in keeping with today's program, I also want to note that the Fowler is in the midst of planning another major exhibition featuring a range of contemporary Vodou-inspired arts, which have flourished in the first tumultuous decade of the 21st century. Scheduled for the fall of 2012 and titled In Extremis, Haitian contemporary artists respond to the 21st century. This project explores how catastrophe inspires remarkable creativity and invention. As you would imagine, the direction and intensity of this project had to be recalibrated after last year's earthquake. This ambitious curatorial effort is also being led by Donald Cosentino, along with the team of other Haitian art specialists and you'll be hearing a little bit more about this project shortly. I am delighted again to welcome you to the Fowler, especially those of you who may never have visited before and hope that you'll have a chance to see our galleries upstairs. 
This is going to be a marvelous afternoon, thoughtfully organized by David Goldberg and Amy Wilentz and moderated by Amy, and will feature a stellar list of Haitian storytellers or storytellers of Haiti. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage David Goldberg. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to see you all here. Uh, this has been almost a year in the making. It, uh, planning for this started right after the uh, earthquake a, little, a year and a week ago, uh, somewhat. And it's uh, fabulous to see the room filled in this way, as Marla says, on a sunny Southern California Saturday afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure to stand here before you. I, uh, before uh, venturing a um, some very small remarks. I just want to thank uh, a number of people who have made uh, this all possible. Uh, from uh, I, I, I won't say much in thanks of Marla and the Fowler because um, Amy will have some words of, of gratitude, uh, but I want to add my uh, profound uh, thanks. There is no better site in which to do an event like this than the Fowler Museum for reasons that um, Marla herself has articulated. Uh, I also want to thank a series of people um, uh, uh, for making uh, the work that brought all this together possible. Uh, Dante Noto, who used to work for UCHRI and now works for the Office of the President, uh, came to me with the idea pretty much a year ago and initiated the conversations with Amy that got all this going. And Dante is here with us today, so it's a uh, uh, a, a great moment to welcome him back into our midst, if he ever left, uh, and I want to thank him. I want to thank uh, Shara Ray Bennett, who you see running around frantically, without whom none of this would have been possible. She got everybody here, she uh, helped to set this up, uh, she's done a fabulous job, almost single-handed, uh, on our side, the, the institute side, in putting this together, having taken over the organization once Dante left. And then I want to add my thanks uh, also to the um, folks at the Fowler Museum, notably Bonnie Poon and Stacy Abenabel, uh, who from the Fowler uh, end of things uh, got us into the space uh, and made this all possible. And then um, uh, also all the speakers who took time out of busy schedules, negotiated complex weather patterns on the East Coast uh, in order to be here, in some cases unsuccessfully, uh, uh, but uh, who have given up their time in order to take part in this uh, day-long uh, series of important conversations. Uh, I will leave one more thank you uh, to the, the end of my remarks, but uh, uh, it has been extraordinarily important in working with all these people, and please join me in giving them a, a warm round of applause. Uh, be, before I close my remarks with um, introducing Amy Wilentz, uh, uh, I just want to say one quite small thing about Haiti, although I think it resonates largely. Uh, Sybil Fisher wrote a book uh, some years ago, um, a, a kind of uh, literary uh, analysis of Haitian history, which she called Modernity Disavowed. And you can quickly, from the title, gather the sense in which uh, she's uh, holding out what was, at the time of the Haitian Revolution, the promise of Haiti uh, to, uh, to enter into modernity, if you want to put it in those terms, uh, and the way that was quickly dashed pretty much from the moment of the revolution uh, onwards. I want to say that's only half right, because I want to say that Haiti is not only modernity disavowed, it's modernity at work. Right? It's the underside, you might say, of modernity uh, that the, the slippages and the shadow life of modernity that is so often hidden from view, uh, and we've seen this played out repeatedly uh, in, in Haitian history. There's a sense in which uh, somebody was mentioning in our conversations this morning, uh, in which Haiti has contributed enormously and importantly to the well-being of the United States from the Louisiana Purchase onwards. Uh, and, and that is true. I, I want to say almost, um, as a provocation, 
that Haiti is America and America is Haiti. Uh, and when one puts it in those kinds of provocative terms, uh, I think it brings home the connection, uh, the connectedness and responsibility that we have uh, to think together uh, about the complex uh, relational situation, both of modernity and the relation of Haiti to modernity and to ourselves sitting here. Uh, having said that, I want to uh, introduce Amy Willens and uh, give a very profound um, extension of gratitude uh, to her who identified all the people who needed to be here and worked relentlessly in getting them here, even when they resisted, as you all know, uh, and uh, you know, to, would not take no for an answer. No, I can't be there, it's too much. Including, in one case, getting out of a sick bed and driving all the way from San Francisco yesterday morning. Right? Um, so uh, a great thank you to Amy. Uh, Amy Wilentz, uh, as Marla said, is a professor of English and uh, in the journalism program at UC Irvine, uh, a colleague of mine. Uh, she is renowned for her relentlessly important writing on uh, the issue of Haiti uh, that has appeared in the New York Times, in the New Yorker, in the Nation, uh, in the LA Times, and so on and so forth. Uh, and if you haven't read her book, uh, The Rainy Season, Haiti Since Duvalier, uh, we're waiting for the, um, uh, for the second version of it uh, to be continued. So Amy Relentz, um, please come and uh, say a few words. Thank you very much. As usual, I have no idea what the schedule is like here. I have no idea what's happening. So I didn't know I was about to be introduced. So you're going to get some very impromptu remarks here. First, I'll try to organize this for a short person. All right, I'll hold it. Um, you know, I've been involved in writing about Haiti for a long time, longer than I like to admit, but basically framed by the Duvalier uh, departure and now the Duvalier return. Um, I, I was in Haiti for the first time five days before Baby Doc left. Uh, and I waited and waited and waited for him to leave. He left, and then I came back like, uh, I've been back and forth, of course, for years, and I wrote my book. And I'm starting work on a new book, uh, The Rainy Season Revised <laughs> and Rethought. Um, and I left on, a, I think, on a Saturday, and he came back on a Sunday. So we don't like to be in the country at the same time. It really isn't big enough for both of us. We see things very differently, I think. He sees himself as holding out hope for Haiti's future. I disagree. <laughs> I don't think he's really that serious either. Um, so one of the things that strikes me when I hear other people talk about me is they, they seem to think that I um, offer some kind of certainty. And I think one of the things we can all say, all of the people here who are going to be speaking to you who have an enormous uh, broad and deep knowledge about Haiti, we can all say with certainty that we speak with no certainty. Because it is, it's a complicated place, it's hard to understand. Um, it needs to be explained. I think what David just said about Haiti being in America, uh, America and America being Haiti is very important, very true. And uh, it, I remember the day when I was first in Haiti and a friend of mine said to me, well, you know, Haiti is the most important African-American country. And I said, it's not African-American. I had no idea what he could mean by that. And now, of course, I understand the full depth of its being African and its being American. And I think that's one of the things that makes it uh, a truly modern place. And I think it's been modern since its revolution. I always argue that it had one of the three great revolutions that made the world we live in today, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution, which changed the boundaries of everything that existed before those revolutions. So uh, that being said, I will say my thank yous too. Thank you to David, who was just so important in, in making this uh, come to be, and to Dante Noto, who was an inspiration to us. And thanks to Marla at the Fowler, who spoke so nicely of the Fowler's contributions in terms of the, the outside world getting to know about Haiti and its traditions. And uh, let's see, and thanks to Sharare, 
who did everything and made my life possible in the past week and a half when things were coming to a head. And I wanted to say uh, that we're sad that Jonathan Demme won't be here today. He's shooting, he's not shooting, he's cutting a documentary on the East Coast and couldn't get away from that. And we're sorry that Debbie Sontag spent a day and a half at the airport trying to get on a plane from New York and couldn't get on a plane, finally threw her hands up and said, I can't do it. And we're sorry that Lune Vio, who uh, is the uh, director of uh, Zami La Santé in Haiti, couldn't be here. Uh, she's a great friend to many of us here, and it's, it's sad that she couldn't be here, but she had more important things that she had to deal with in Haiti. So that said, I guess we'll begin our program, and I'll be talking to you more later. Uh, thank you. Just, just to give you a sense how the afternoon will run, uh, there'll be a two-hour session broken into four parts uh, with two or three speakers uh, per session. So I'm going to ask the first speakers, Damon Winter and um, uh, Don Constantino, uh, to come up and, uh, and join us. Uh, Damon will speak first. Damon, uh, you've, you've, uh, if you don't know who he is, you've probably seen his photographs, at the very least from Haiti. Um, uh, without knowing perhaps that they're his. Um, he, uh, he works for the New York Times and he's a f uh, f photojournalist for the New York Times. He's worked for a range of other important news outlets including Newsweek uh, and uh, the Dallas Morning Herald and uh, on and on and on. He's been nominated and has been a finalist for Pulitzer Prize for work that he's done and he's a, a renowned photographer and uh, he will exhibit some of his work as he speaks to us. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes and uh, will, uh, at the end of each half hour session, uh, we'll have about a 10 minute um, uh, period for, for question and answer. Uh, and then the la there'll be a break and then the la last hour will be a panel discussion uh, among uh, remaining speakers. Um, Don Constantino uh, has already been introduced in a sense by Marla. He's a professor of world arts and culture at the University of California, uh, Los Angeles, and of course has been an incredibly important contributor uh, to thinking about Haitian art uh, and indeed, as Marla said, to mounting uh, the exhibitions here. So Damon and Don will uh, kick us off and I'll be the awful timekeeper. Um, Well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm actually really honored uh, and flattered that I was invited to participate. Uh, it's kind of fitting that I'm the first speaker in this group because I'm the one person who is not an expert on Haiti. Um, all the people that you will hear from today have lived in, worked in, written about, photographed, helped Haiti for uh, many years, if not many decades. Um, and my first experience in Haiti was only quite recently, um, touching down on January 13th, 2010, less than 24 hours after the earthquake struck. And this is my first impression of Haiti. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about my experiences there. I've been back uh, five times over the course of the year to cover the aftermath of the earthquake, elections, a cholera epidemic. Um, uh, so entering into this assignment, I sort of have to ask myself, how does one go into a place like Haiti with such a rich and storied history, um, such uh, a history of brilliant imagery to come out of it, um, with no prior knowledge, no history, um, and, and try to tell the story with authority for the newspaper that is known as the, the newspaper of record. Um, and the only way I could possibly do this without killing myself is to think that somehow that's a blessing, um, that I didn't come into my coverage of Haiti with any sentimentality, um, with any romantic notions or memories about the place or uh, my prior experiences there. Um, I grew up in the Virgin Islands, uh, not far from Haiti, uh, and when I landed there, it smelled like home. It's a, it's a very different culture from where I grew up, but it felt, uh, it felt familiar to me. It didn't feel like an exotic, distant place. Um, I remember the imagery that, that stuck in my head from Haiti from all the years and you know, the things that really stuck in my mind um, with this beautiful, saturated, golden light, the colors of Haiti, the art, um, 
I remember images of exquisitely dressed men and women burying their dead in pastel cemeteries. I remember images of extreme violence and uh, acts of violence that I, I could not fathom experiencing. Um, and, I, and I thought to myself that I, with all this history, with all this uh, visual history in Haiti, I wanted my photographs as best I could to stand on their own. And I wanted the people in these photographs not to be burdened with the baggage of the history of, of imagery from Haiti. Um, this story was very important. It was one of the worst, if not the worst disaster I'm sure I will ever experience in my lifetime. Um, and, uh, it, and it was enough, it was enough for them to stand on their own. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to walk you through my experiences over the course of the year quickly and, uh, and tell you a little bit about my impressions there. Um, the thing that struck me, and I, I think every day working in Haiti, was what an impossible task it was to try to convey the magnitude of, of both the pain and the suffering and, and simply the destruction. Um, and you would, you would kill yourself trying to... Um, and there, and there was a tremendous guilt on my part, too, for not being able to fully tell the story because I think it was just impossible. Um, and I, I always likened it to the feeling of standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and peering over. And it's a, an, Im an image that is very familiar to everyone. Uh, it's been photographed a million times, but there's no single image that could ever capture what it feels like to stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Uh, it just cannot be translated, and that's exactly how I felt being in Haiti. And some of the photos, uh, hopefully you can see them okay. I'm sorry they're a little dark. Uh, we'll just let them speak on their own because there's nothing I can really add to. And this was the first evening just a little over 24 hours after the earthquake. And these were women that couldn't get into a hospital. They had shut their doors. Um, this is near the Olofsson Hotel, just a few blocks away. And um, that first night was such a powerful evening. The sounds that filled the air. There were things that I couldn't photograph because it was pitch black and there was no, there was no light in Port-au-Prince, no electricity. Um, but all that night, um, you hear the sounds of people crying and screaming, um, interspersed with singing and prayer. And um, it, was, it was an incredible, this is something that I would remember more than any image I ever took or any image I ever saw, was that those sounds, um, and at some point there was an aftershock and the it felt like the whole city erupted in fear and that this, um, you know, that I had missed the initial experience of the earthquake, but to get a small sense of the terror that it must have caused in people was quite powerful. I'm sorry this is so dark. Um, this is really uh, one of the most difficult scenes I, I think I've ever seen in my life at, at the city morgue. Um, bodies had been gathered from all across the city. Uh, and it was one of these situations that um, it was so it was so awful, and you ha you get there, and you try to figure out how do I photograph this and tell people what is happening here, and how do I do it in a way that is not disgusting, and that affords people some measure of respect that they deserve. Um, and this was constantly a challenge. I, I think, in large part, um, you know, the media didn't probably do a terrific job of it. Uh, I saw a lot of photos that came out that were just. Um, Really difficult, really insensitive. But it, you know, it's a, I think it's a tremendous challenge to take something, uh, a situation where you have 200,000 to 250,000 people dead, and um, and convey that in a way that people are able to understand without having to to turn away, to turn their heads, um, but and to to make them feel, to make them understand what had happened. This man had had left Haiti um, a day before the earthquake and gone to his home in Orlando. Uh, and the next day he found out that the earthquake had happened and his uh, sister had been killed and he immediately returned. And uh, when I found him, he had just uncovered her body and collapsed with grief on the sidewalk. And in the immediate aftermath, these sisters had discovered that their mother was trapped in one of the buildings. I guess, I guess my goal um, in covering this earthquake too, you know, like what I said in the beginning, that it was really impossible to convey the magnitude of, of the disaster. It, it was just something that they couldn't be done. Um, without being there, you would never be able to understand. Um, but I, I think the only way I could, I could sort of go beyond that was try to make photos that, that were personal and that had impact and that were powerful um, in a way that let you understand um, what people were going through there and how, how, deeply, um, how deeply it hurt. Uh, 
in the in the weeks following the earthquake, um, bodies started appearing on the streets, uh, you know, with little to no police presence um, in neighborhoods. People started taking justice into their own hands. Um, Four thousand inmates had escaped from the national prison downtown, uh, and many neighborhoods had just decided we're going to take care of this. Um, this was the first funeral, this is a full two weeks after the earthquake, the first funeral that I encountered um, is for a, a funeral for Pastor Guy Perpignan. And it was, it was actually a wonderful experience for me because I had I sort of felt like I had gone through this really traumatic event um, in covering this. And I, I hadn't even had a moment, I think, to stop and breathe and to understand what had happened. And this was the first time that I had actually seen any expression of public grief beyond the initial shock of the first couple of days. Um, and I found Haiti, you know, never having been there before and sort of not having anything to compare it to, but you could tell that the entire people were in shock. Um, and, I, and I can't imagine um, that it was all at all like the Haiti before the earthquake. Um, so for me, this was, uh, you know, I think as cathartic a moment as for the people at this funeral and to sit back and to hear the songs uh, and to watch people being able to grieve for the first time was really amazing for me. Gaya tu le sayo, ogunno, diabla diab moze moi si sa vrai, pa fout vrai, sa se joue timunio, sa se blague, ogunno.